say goodbye to monotonous books and hello to interconnecting colorful mind maps. Welcome to another discussion on our mind map series where we help you quickly revise important points for your competitive exams. In this mind map, we will briefly cover the vast topic of epidemiology. So, let's begin. There are three main types of epidemiology, which are descriptive, analytical and experimental. Descriptive epidemiology is the initial phase of any epidemiological investigation and plays a crucial role in formulating hypotheses about a disease. It involves a systematic approach to studying and understanding the characteristics of a disease within a population. The first step in descriptive epidemiology is to define the population that will be studied. Next, the disease under study is defined and described in detail. This includes examining its various aspects such as its occurrence over time, its distribution across different geographic locations and its impact on different individuals. To accurately measure the disease, reliable and standardized methods are employed. This may involve collecting data on the number of cases, the severity of symptoms, or any relevant risk factors. Comparing the disease with known indices or benchmarks is another important step in descriptive epidemiology. The next step is the comparative analysis helps to contextualize the disease and identify any deviations or anomalies. In the last step, Based on the observations and analysis conducted during the descriptive epidemiology phase, researchers can formulate etiological hypotheses. The next aspect, which is the time distribution of diseases, can be denoted by short-term, long-term or periodic fluctuations. Short-term fluctuations in disease occurrence can manifest as epidemics, which often exhibit distinct patterns and can be categorized into different types. They can be common source epidemics, propagated epidemics, or modern epidemics. Secular trends or long-term fluctuations can be seen in disease occurrence over several years. For communicable diseases such as poliomyelitis, diphtheria, and pertussis, a decreasing trend has been observed in India over the past few decades. Conversely, Non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension and obesity have shown an increasing trend during the same period. The third type, periodic fluctuations, can manifest as seasonal or cyclical trends. Examples for both these trends can be seen in the table on the screen. Coming to the next category, analytical epidemiology is the second major type of study conducted to test hypotheses and establish the cause of a disease by investigating the association between exposure to a risk factor and occurrence of the disease. Various types of studies fall under analytical epidemiology, including ecological studies, cross-sectional studies, case control studies and cohort studies. Synonyms of names of epidemiological studies are as seen in this table on our mind map. Cross-sectional studies are simple observational studies that involve the examination of a representative sample of a population at a specific point in time. They provide information on the prevalence of the disease and offer a snapshot of the population's health status. Cross-sectional studies are particularly useful for studying chronic diseases. Cohort studies, on the other hand, focus on individual participants and follow them over a specified period. Cohort studies can provide valuable information on incidence rates and relative risks. Some advantages and disadvantages of cohort studies are as seen here. There are different types of cohort studies. They can be prospective, retrospective and mixed retrospective prospective. The first type, prospective cohort studies, involve following a group of individuals who are initially free from the disease and assessing the development of the disease over time in both exposed and non-exposed groups. Retrospective cohort studies, on the other hand, look back in time and identify cohorts based on exposure and outcome status recorded in past hospital or college records. Both exposed and non-exposed groups are then followed to determine the development of the disease. 
In some cases, a combined prospective retrospective cohort study, also known as a mixed cohort study, is conducted. The design combines elements of both prospective and retrospective cohort studies. It involves looking back in time to identify cohorts based on exposure status and following them prospectively into the future to assess the outcome. An important part of any study is determining the strength of association. For cohort study, it is measured in terms of relative risk, attributable risk, population attributable risk. Amongst these, the most important ones are relative risk and attributable risk. Relative risk or RR is calculated by incidence among exposed divided by incidence among non-exposed. RR greater than 1 suggests a positive association. Relative risk equal to 1 indicates no association. And relative risk less than 1 indicates a negative association. Attributable risk or AR is calculated by incidence among exposed minus incidence among non-exposed divided by incidence among exposed multiplied by 100. AR represents the proportion of disease that can be attributed to exposure. The formula and interpretation of population attributable risk can be calculated as shown in the table. Moving on, the next type of study that is important for us to revise is the case control study. Both exposure and outcome have occurred before the start of the study. Its advantages and disadvantages are as seen here in the mind map. The strength of association in a case controlled study is calculated by using relative risk and odds ratio. Odds ratio or cross product ratio is calculated as AD divided by BC, where A, B, C, and D represent the frequency of exposure and outcome. There are some important differences between relative risk and odds ratio, which you can note down from this table. A subtype called the nested case control study is a hybrid design where a case control study is nested in a cohort study. Its usefulness is very limited and is not often used apart from in the case of rare diseases. For a quick revision of analytical epidemiology, you can take a look at this table denoting the relationship between outcome and exposure in various studies. Phew, that was a lot to take in. Are you bored already? Don't worry, we are here to refresh you with an exciting surprise at the end of this video. Stick around to find out. The third type or experimental epidemiology includes randomized controlled trials or RCTs, which are a different type of study design used in clinical research to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions or treatments. Randomized controlled trials, a patient is the unit of study instead of the population. There are two types of randomized control trials, concurrent parallel and a crossover design. In the concurrent parallel design, comparisons are made between two groups, the experimental group, which receives the specific medication or intervention, and the reference group, which does not receive the specific medication or intervention. On the other hand, in crossover design, Participants initially belong to either the experimental or reference group. After a certain period, the groups are crossed over where the exposed group becomes non-exposed and vice versa. This design helps address ethical concerns and allows each participant to serve as their own control. An important part of randomized control trials is the intention to treat trials. This concept implies that the results of a randomized controlled trial are analyzed based on the initial assessment treatment group, regardless of attrition or changes in study subjects from one group to another. It helps maintain the integrity of the randomized design. Coming to a crucial component of RCTs, which is randomization. It is a crucial component of RCTs. It involves allocating participants randomly to either the experimental or reference group and removes both confounding and bias. It is commonly performed using random number tables, computer software, currency notes or lottery methods. 
There are different types of trials in experimental epidemiology, which includes pre post clinical trials, pre clinical, and clinical trials. Out of these, clinical trials are very important for any exam. So let's go over a few details about the same. Before beginning with the clinical trials, preclinical trials are done to determine initial safety, dosing, and potential effectiveness of the intervention. Clinical phase involves phase zero, in which unit of study is health human volunteers. The next phase is phase one, in which the unit of study healthy human volunteers to determine safety of drug. Maximum tolerated dose or MTD is determined in this phase. Phase 2 involves study of patients with the target condition or disease for effectiveness. And in phase 3, it is studied for comparison with existing drugs. New drugs is launched in the market after a successful phase 3. In the final phase of phase 4, patients taking the drug are evaluated for long-term side effects or post-marketing surveillance. Now that we have gone through this, you can take a quick note of some details about pre-post clinical trials. This was all about analytical epidemiology. As we have seen, all these studies are multi-step processes, so there is a scope for error in quite a few places. Let's take a look at the potential errors in epidemiological studies, which can be random errors or systematic errors. The first one. Random errors are mostly due to lack of precision in measurement due to random variation. It cannot be completely eliminated but can be reduced by increasing the sample size. The next one, systematic errors or biases occur during data collection, compilation, analysis and interpretation. They are of three types. First one, subject bias is the error introduced by study subjects such as the Hawthorne effect or recall bias. The second one is investigator bias in which errors are introduced by the investigator such as selection bias. Lastly, we have analyzer bias which errors are introduced during data analysis or interpretation. We have listed some important types of biases in epidemiological studies in this table. You can pause the video here for some time and make a note of these as they can be important MCQ questions. Now that we have seen how many errors can rise, can you guess what we do to minimize biases in epidemiological studies? You guessed correctly. We make use of blinding. It can be either single, double or triple blinding. In single blinding, study subjects are unaware of the treatment they are receiving. Whereas in double blinding, both study subjects and investigators are unaware of treatment being administered. In triple blinding, study subjects, investigators and analyzers, all three are unaware of the treatment assignment. When talking about errors, it is also important to know what confounding is. Confounding occurs when a factor associated with both the exposure and the outcome has an independent effect on the outcome. It is found unequally distributed between the study and control groups. Confounders can distort the results if not properly accounted for. How do we remove these confounding factors? There are many ways to control this like restriction, stratification and statistical modeling. But the two we will discuss in detail are matching and randomization. What are they? Matching is the process of selecting controls in such a way that they are similar to cases in terms of certain variables that may influence the outcome of the disease. Types of matching include caliper matching, frequency matching, category matching, individual matching and pair matching. The next method, randomization, is superior compared to matching and blinding in addressing biases. It helps remove selection bias known confounding factors and unknown confounding factors. Randomization can be done using random number tables, computer software, currency notes or lottery methods. By addressing and minimizing these potential errors, epidemiological studies can improve the validity and reliability of their findings. Some other key points related to epidemiology such as endemics, pandemics, etc. can be noted from this section of our mind map. With this, we have come to the end of this video discussion on basic concepts of epidemiology. We hope we have been able to help you with revising some important topics. And now for the exciting surprise that awaits you.
You can now access our MCQ series at a lower price. Use coupon code MCQ10 for a 10% discount on the MCQ series. Happy learning!